This morning's reading is from the Gospel according to John, chapter 15, verses 1 through 11. I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that does not bear fruit, he, pr he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. We are still in our series about the word of God. Uh, it's, these last few weeks, we'll be kind of focusing more or less on where it's specifically where a uh, place in scripture where it describes the God's word as something to looking at a few passages where it talks about uh, the value of God's word. And I hope you saw that uh, in this passage here as well. Uh, about a week ago, I'm more of a morning person. Um, no one else in my family really is. Uh, but I don't expect them to be morning people. I just let them know that, you know, I'm not going to just don't be grumpy. That's my only rule. But it was a couple mornings ago, and, and I was up, and one of my sons was up as well, and he um, uh, was eating cereal, and I popped up next to him and grabbed a bowl of cereal and wanted to share about, I had a, kind of a funny dream, and was just having a little father-son moment of uh, eating cereal and talking, sharing my story. So I shared my story, and I looked at my son and said, what do you think? And nothing, just staring at the cereal. I'm like, hey, and my son looks up at me, and I realize he had ear pods on. <laughs> that was our bonding moment. <laughs> We're going to be looking at a passage, a very well-known passage if you haven't read it, that talks about the word abide, abide in me. A different translation talk about to remain or to abide. Another translation is to be present. Um, while both my son and I were in the same room, one of us was not present um, in the conversation. We're talking about what it means to be present with God today. And so uh, asking yourself the question, where are you <laughs> when it comes to relationship with God? And so uh, the, we'll see in this passage that the word of God is fruitful. Well, we're going to see that we're talking about the, the word of God, knowing the word of God, it's a fruitful thing to have in your life. It bears much fruit. So that's what we're going to look at today. Please pray with me. Lord God, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this time to gather. We'd like to lift up all those in our church who need your word, and that is all of us, who need your presence, that is all of us. We start off by lifting up all the kids in our church, so many of them we are thankful for, Lord God, so many uh, newborn, so many on the way. Father, we pray that, Holy, you would send your spirit that these children would never know a moment without you as their savior. We pray for their parents, all those who work with kids, that you would give them grace and wisdom to share the gospel and to love these kids. Father, we pray for uh, all adult children who may have wandered away from you. Lord, we ask that you would send your spirit to draw them back in. We pray for all those listening now, that Holy Spirit, that through your power, you would take um, your word and help us to die to sin and become more alive to you. Father, we pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So again, digging in this passage where Jesus is, I am the vine, is part of his famous, Jesus has a famous place where he's, they're called the seven I am's, where he describes himself, I am, and uses some different uh, uh, ways to explain that this is the last of them, I am the vine. Uh, and uh, in this particular passage, you got to remember, he's using an illustration to explain something. And uh, like with all illustrations, 
or analogies, you don't want to push them too far. In this particular one, uh, in Luke 15, people love to push it as far as humanly possible, which is fun for conversations, but we want to try and stick to the general of what Jesus is teaching here about what it means that he is the vine, uh, what we're talking about that as we're looking at it. And so just the very beginning, verses 1 through 3, I am the true vine, my father is the vine dresser. Again, the, the little subtlety in the word there, the true vine really is saying, I'm the only vine there should be. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word I've spoken to you. And so what he wants us to go here, where he's going with this, this analogy, this example, He's saying something very simple, that Jesus himself sees him as the vine. And again, the, think of a uh, uh, growing wine, vine off of, you have the, the vine lines that you're growing. You're trying to grow grape seeds or whatever. I mean, grapes on the vine. This is kind of the idea you're, you're going for here. That Jesus says he is the vine. Um, the father is the vine dresser, the one who's taking care of the vine. And the branches are us. And really this illustration is, it's a little bit on who's the vine, who's the vine dresser. But as we see at the end, it's really about the bearing of the fruit. Uh, he's wanting to talk about the importance of understanding that he wants us to bear spiritual fruit. Now, there's other places in scripture. There's other analogies where Jesus talks about, or the apostles talk about fruit. There's the fruit of the spirit, slightly different analogy. You don't want to combine the two here. This is just using this illustration of what it means to be connected to the vine and bearing fruit. And God wants us to bear this fruit. And we see God's word already showing up right here in verse 3. You're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. Uh, think of John 13, 10, and 11, where Jesus is te teaching about what it means um, that he is word, that he is clean, cleaning you. Again, so the idea being where people get confused with this analogy is uh, we believe that once you're connected to Christ, it's inseparable, right? There is no divorce from Christ. Once you're in him, you're in him forever. And this analogy seems to kind of go in some different directions. I want to make sure we understand that Jesus is not talking about somehow you can be in him and all of a sudden no longer in him. Um, and this passage talks well about how we understand that, why we even do each week here. We do a confession of repentance, and we ask, encourage you to do it as well. It's from teaching of Jesus himself. The one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet. He's completely clean. What is it talking about? Well, in one sense, again, we can go back to the verse in John. God's word has cleaned us. Again, we are, we are, if we are in the vine, we have been forgiven of our sins, but there is still sin to work on right? There are still effects in our life. There are still things that we get dirty with, and those things need to be cleaned up. You're already clean because of the word I've spoken to you. See God's words. We're talking about abide, and we'll see God's words going to come up often in this passage about what it means to abide, to remain, to be present with the Lord. But when reading this, keep in mind, the goal of this is for you to think about fruit, the goal of you being connected to the vine, why God is going to prune, all of that is so that you would bear fruit. And so the question you want to be asking yourself right now is, what spiritual fruit is in your life? Uh, don't really think of the fruit of the Spirit. Again, that's a different topic. He's just talking about, and we're going to talk about what is the fruit here? What does it look like? And in this analogy here, in this story, uh, Jesus, I think, has a much clear, uh, much clear idea for what he wants us to understand when he's talking about fruit. So don't think of fruit of the Spirit. But he is talking about he wants you to be producing a fruit by being in this, by being present, by abiding, by remaining in him. So let's look now at verses four and six, four through six. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he is it that bears much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like branches and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. So what is, again, what are we talking about here as we're looking through this passage? Well, we see four through six, I think it's a great uh, presentation of the gospel, the good news of Christ. I was working, uh, this happened a couple times, um, some people I've worked with in different situations where my job was to be the evaluator of their, how they were doing uh, in, in, in a ministry setting. And both times it was kind of, it was kind of funny how it would happen. So if my job is the evaluator. My job is to meet with you and tell you how you're doing. And um, 
part of the meeting, reason for the meetings was because they weren't doing well. And so my job was to help talk with them and talk about how, you know, it's not going well and how we can do better. And I had two very different people who had the same thing when it was time to talk about what wasn't going well and how to, you know, get, get a little better. Their response was, could we just not talk about the things I'm not doing well and just talk about the things I'm doing well at these meetings? And I thought, well, then that would, that, that we could, but then nothing would ever change in your life. And when we're talking about the gospel, it's another word for good news. Uh, you, it can't be good news unless there's bad news, right? And the reason why bad news is bad news is because it's not good news. And when we're reading about what it means to abide, the verses four through six, I see a lot of good news here, and I see a lot of bad news, right? We see the evidence again. Verse six was very clear. If you're not genuinely connected to the vine then your destiny is to wither and to be tossed into flame, which is, uh, if any commentator would tell you, that's fire and stuff is, has a lot to do with judgment. So your, your destiny by not being connected to the vine is, is judgment. Where you're headed is judgment for your sins. That's, that's what's coming for you if you're not connected to the vine. But if you are connected to the vine, there's a lot of good news there. The bad news is if you're not connected... Your destiny is withering and to be collected and tossed into the fire. But if you are connected to the vine, something great, there is fruit that is coming. Uh, in the Bible, you'll see lots of times God likes to talk about promises and curses. Blessings and curses. This is a blessing if you do this, curses if you do this. And all of it is designed to keep you focused on who Christ is and focused on God and not wandering away. And this passage is very similar. To abide in the vine is life and fruit. To not abide in the vine is to wither and die. You don't need to press the illustration further than that. It's not trying to communicate, uh, uh, can you lose your salvation? It's say, simply saying, if you're not connected to the vine, it is bad news. But to be connected to the vine is great news. Uh, in theology, uh, part of our Reformed understanding, uh, the word we like to talk about, how we understand what it means to be connected to the vine, uh, is a term we like to call perseverance of the saints, which means that as God uh, claims you, you may stumble and struggle, but if you are genuinely connected to the vine, your vine connection will not break. It's an important concept because, as we've mentioned, there is no human relationship like that. There is no human relationship where you can bend it so far it'll never break. Every relationship has the potential to break, except the one that God has initiated with us. The Westminster Confession of Faith talks about perseverance of the saints, what it means to connect it. In chapter 7, it has three paragraphs. The first paragraph just says this. The Westminster Confession of Faith is our theological document that kind of guides us helps us understand uh, scripture a little better, written by a whole bunch of people a couple hundred years ago. But it says this, those whom God has accepted in his son and has effectually called and sanctified by his spirit can never completely or finally fall out of their state of grace. Rather, they shall definitely continue in that state to the end and are eternally saved. We understand very firmly that when you are in Christ, you are in him for all time. But put verse 4 through 6 up again. When I read verses 4 through 6, Abide in me, I and you just unless the branch cannot bear fruit by itself, unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you abide unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him is he that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. So I'm going to read verses 4 through 6. 6 is the part about being withered. There's a definitely a question being asked or a choice that's being asked of you. Do you want to be connected to the vine or not? There is a choice. To not be connected to the vine means something. To be connected to the vine does mean something as well. What is your choice when it comes to that? Hard to put this way. Um, 
when it comes to abiding, when it comes to, when you think about God's word coming into your life, um, uh, as, as you read it, sometimes uh, a story can be dry or boring, and it was a, when you're reading to your kids and you take it and you try to twist it around to make it exciting and something entertaining for them. Sometimes uh, when you have a job that you find very meaningless, you try to find something to do to, to, to make it meaningful. Sometimes when a relationship doesn't seem very fulfilling, you do something to make it fulfilling. And, and for many of you, you may approach the Bible that way. But that's not what it is. We've talked about how the, the Word of God is living and active. Your job isn't to give the Bible meaning and purpose. God's Word is going to come and give you meaning and purpose. Your job isn't to bring the Bible to life. God's word is going to bring you to life. It's going to raise the dead on the inside. I heard a commentator put it this way. It's like the same thing with the gospel. Your job isn't to make the gospel come alive. The gospel is going to come and make you alive. And again, so I'm going to read verses 4 through 6. I hear a choice. I see a choice being asked of you. What does God's word, what does being connected to the vine mean to you? John 10.10, 10, Jesus says it very well. The thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come that you may have life abundantly. This is why he's come to bring you life. This is what God's word is going to do, is going to bring life. Your job isn't to make the Bible come alive. God's word is going to come and make it alive in your hearts. So the, the question being asked is, where are you going to choose to abide? Where are you going to choose to remain? What is your choice? In the vine or on your own where you're with her? And then we get to where most people think where all of the vine is coming together at verse 7. This whole analogy is coming together at verse 7. Verse 7 says this, If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. So we have this great illustration. I am the vine, God, the Father is the vine dresser, the branches, and you have the fruit, and everything's coming together here at verse 7. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. There was a show I was absolutely addicted to on uh, television. Uh, it was about a group of people um, spending their, their, their life digging for gold. And it made it so interesting because you had just just people who were completely not supposed to be doing that, doing it, and constantly making bad, bad decisions. It was so riveting. Always where they would dig, they would dig and find stuff and then dig somewhere else. It was awesome to watch all the bad decisions people can make in their life trying to find gold. But when they found gold, they would say, we hit pay dirt. We hit what we're looking for. Pay dirt is where the gold was living in the dirt. And they would use that expression all the time. We're looking for pay dirt. We hit pay dirt. There's no pay dirt here. It's all about pay dirt. It's where finally, all that effort, you finally are now digging out what it is you wanted. You're finding the gold. And I think in verse 7, this is it. This is the pay dirt of what it means to be connected to the vine. And it's expressed what this fruit looks like to truly be abiding, where God's word's abiding and remaining in you. How, what this fruit looks like here is prayer. The fruit isn't prayer, but the fruit is being described, an example, as prayer. When everything is happening, when you're abiding, God's word is abiding in you. So what does it look like to be connected to the vine? His word is abiding in you. His word is present in your life. And how it looks when it's unfolding, what this fruit looks like is prayer. And it says, ask whatever you wish and it'll be done for you. This is not, as everyone knows, this doesn't mean literally anything you want he'll give to you. It means always, if you pray according to his will, you get what is asked for. First John 5, 14 says that. If you ask according to his will, then yes. And so what is verse 7 talking about? Again, if you're abiding in him and his words are abiding in you, it's a two-way. You abiding in him looks like his words abiding in you. His, his word is present in your life. What it looks like, what it feels like, what it sounds like. Again, he's given an example of you're praying and your prayers are like lockstep in the spirit. That's what it's supposed to sound like. You have an expression like two peas in a pod. 
If God's word is abiding in you, then it means then your presence with God is intimate. It's what it's supposed to be doing. God's word is transforming. It's in your heart. You are present with him. His word is present in you. And so when you're praying, you can't help but pray according to the will of God. You're like two peas in a pod. You're like a teacher and a, your master walking around. This is what discipleship looks like. What God wants us to look like as disciples, as followers of Christ, is we're present with him, we're sort of abiding, we're present with him, and his word is present in your life. So much so that when you pray, you can't help but pray according to the will of God. I could give a sports analogy. I'm trying to think about which generation I should hit. Um, it's, uh, I apologize, it's a sports one again. So I always want to, if it's basketball, I always want to use Michael Jordan, but I won't because I'll be made fun of. But um, uh, there right now, there's a basketball player. Uh, he's he's, he's three-pointers when you shoot in basketball. It's when you shoot back pretty far back from across the line. The best three-point shooter in the history of the game is alive right now. His name is Steph Curry. Uh, he's actually happens to also be a believer. But uh, he, he's been in the, the NBA for a while, and he linked up with a coach named Steph Curry, who he himself... Uh, has won a few NBA championships. And when they finally linked up together, Steph Curry started winning NBA championships. What does it look like when you're abiding in God and his words abiding in you? When the master is abiding with you, it looks like that. You're running around doing whatever, but the master's come and now together what's happening is something you couldn't even imagine. This is what it's supposed to look like, what it means to abide in the vine and God's words abiding in you is that together, his word in your heart is taking you places and doing things that you could never do. His word abiding in you, his words abiding in you means that his words have mastery over you. And what does that mastery look like? What does that fruit look like? Again, he describes it as prayer, just wonderful prayer. Prayer is really just your theology and practice. If you want to know what your theology is like, just have someone listen to your prayers. They'll tell you what your theology is. Do you really, are you really reformed? Do you really believe in a God that can do anything? Then we should hear it in your prayers. And this is what he's saying. Your prayers will reveal to you is God's word abiding inside of you. And then he talks about what this looks like. Again, he goes further with the fruit in verses 8 to 11. It says, By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove yourself to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that, you may be my, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. So pulling it all together. He talks about this glorious of you abiding in him, and him abiding in you. And he says, when this happens... When God's word is abiding in your heart, he says, you bring glory to God. You are glorifying God by that. And not only are you glorifying God, at the same time, you are bringing down upon yourself love and joy. Think about that. The gospel message, you've got to choose to be connected to the vine and live, to not be connected and wither and die but being connected to the vine looks like, again, you abiding in him and him abiding in you, his word abiding in you. And as that happens, this is how God wants to be glorified. This is how he wants you to bring glory to his name by his word abiding in your heart. And at the same time, as you're glorifying God, he is raining down on you his love and his joy. To abide means to be present, to remain. Is his word present in your life? Are you abiding in him? What is the fruit of your presence with God right now? Are you the branch in need of the vine? Are you the branch that's in need of the pruning so that you will produce more fruit. The abiding presence of the word of God in our life 
looks like glorifying God, looks like joy, looks like grace raining down on us. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, it is you who make all this possible. Without your death on the cross, we have no choice. We have no hope. We have no future glory with you. But because you died on a cross, we have it all. Lord, help us to see, are we present with you? Is your word present in our hearts? Lord, make your word present. Make it abide in our hearts that we may produce the fruit that you desire that glorifies your name. Jesus, thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Please stand for our final song.